face, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the starship Enterprise. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We are going to be discussing the journey to Babel, or Babel as they pronounce it, I suppose correctly. This is episode 10 of season 2, directed by Joseph Pebney, written by DC Fontana, aired back on November 17th, 1967. This is the episode where we meet Spock's parents. There is a diplomatic crisis, and Spock has to undergo a emergency uh, medical procedure to save his father's life. We're joined by Mark. Mark, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Wes. We are going to be talking about the journey to Babel. Babel. Now I've, I've worked into my brain. I'm going to say it backwards all the time. Do you always know? Have to? Is this a word that you always have to look up? I always have to look up how you pronounce. Babel. Um. So I should have researched uh, the historical significance of Babel. Uh, isn't biblical. it pronounced Babel? Yeah. It's uh. No, it's, it's biblical. Ba- it's Babel. It's, really? Yeah. It's like. It's like seagull. <laughs> it's ba- Babel. Yeah, ba- it's like down by the bay. Da- Babel. <laughs> down by the Babel. Down by the Babel. Yeah, it's not Babel, but it is Babel. So anyway, enough of the uh, discussion about how you pronounce it. We're going to get to the episode. I thought we could spend uh, the entire hour on that. We could just <laughs> we'll be we'll be uh, circling back around it. It's obviously the most important part. We'll be right back after we play an audio clip. Me and Mark are going to break down this episode, Journey to Babel. My aides and she who is my wife. Captain Kirk? Our pleasure, madam. As soon as you're settled, I'll arrange a tour of the ship. Mr. Spark will conduct you. I prefer another guide, Captain. As you wish, Ambassador. Mr. Spark, we'll leave orbit in two hours. Would you care to beam down and visit your parents? Captain. Ambassador Sarek and his wife are my parents. Now, Mark, you're back for your third episode of TOS. We're going to be talking about the introduction of Spock's parents and all that stuff. So, where do we want to start with this one? Do you have any overarching thoughts or feelings about this one? Well, I think there's a a lot to dissect on this one. I'm going to do my best to bring my A game. I don't know if I can match the sexual tension that you and Amy usually bring to the podcast. Yeah, right. Or or perhaps Clay, but I'll... (laughs) <laughs> so I was listening to an episode recently. I'm like, you can cut the cut cut the tension in the air with a knife between uh, with me your, and me and Clay. Or? Uh, well, you and Amy, but you know, possibly you and Clay. I guess. Yeah, but. Well, me and Amy are obviously naked and talk. We had to do a, a mock time, so obviously tensions were very high. Tensions were very high. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's there's a lot going on in that episode. Um, I mean, I guess uh, this this seems like an an episode that kind of has multiple themes and acts. And maybe maybe it makes sense to start at the beginning with uh, sort of like the the alien dinner party, uh, yeah. you know, getting all the delegates together. Um, and and it's just because I hadn't watched through uh, TOS originally, but this is a very vibrant scene for me. Some of the aliens were were definitely interesting. I did not re- uh, remember the Tellurides or the um, Andorians. Andorians. Thank you. I would have definitely screwed that up. But uh, there are, there are a lot of interesting character designs that made uh, TOS, and I think this uh, this episode definitely had some some of those. Yeah. So it does more. I mean, it it. In, it introduces Sarek as Spock's father and everything, and that's sort of like on the level. But the Andorians, Tellurites, tell, I think it's Tellurites, and humans and Vulcans, who are the four races that are involved in the party scene and negotiations, are going to be retconned to be the four founding members of the Federation. So it's kind of important that those are the aliens that are here, I suppose. Uh, the Tellurites look like little pig people with horrible masks. The Andorians have like antennas and they're blue. And then the humans and Vulcans we're familiar with. And I mean, I feel like the Tellurides were like a bit too on the nose. Uh, no pun intended because they did have, you know, rather... Pig nose. Pr- pig noses. I always but... think of Chief Wiggum. <laughs> Look at his nose. <laughs> yeah. But but they were like so over the top and in your face. It's like, wouldn't it have been funny if they would have been more diplomatic and... <laughs> Yeah, like they're like they're the well composed species, but no, they're they're obnoxious as they look. Yeah, they're not. Um, they obviously weren't designed at this point to be the founding members, so it's interesting that you get like a little bit of tension between all of them, which I yeah. think works for it. Uh, they'll be more explored in Enterprise and everything and, when it goes back to that point. And the Andorians just kind of look like if you took Ziggy Stardust era Bowie and crossed it with a Smurf. Yeah, you would basically. just that that's where you would end up. 
white haired antennas, <laughs> yeah. smurf type people. Yeah, and uh, I guess most importantly, we sort of get a better look at the Vulcans, which we haven't seen the Vulcans since Amok time. Um, so it's been a little while in terms of episodes, although in terms of podcast episodes, it hasn't been very long at all. I think they do a much better job of showing the Vulcans in this one, although I think I still have the kind of problem of I don't really understand what the Vulcans consider to be logical. Uh, at least It's whatever the story needs, Wes. I least, think that's that's clearly the definition of logical. At least Sarek in this one acts like a Vulcan that I'd kind of expect. And something that's been interesting is that the t- like the races of aliens that get introduced always really depend on the strength of the first person to portray them. And then they kind of get written that way. Um, Sarek comes in. Spock was obviously the first Vulcan to be portrayed. But going back to Vulcan in a mock time was kind of a letdown because... The Vulcans don't act the way that I think that they should. And Sarek comes here, along here, and I think he acts more in line with what I'd expect a Vulcan to act. He acts more like Spock, which I think is appropriate. So that Spock doesn't seem to be like the outlier of Vulcan society, where he's the only one that really cares about the logical, rational pursuit of stuff. And we meet his father, and uh, they do the TOS thing of they introduce a plot line where you're kind of surprised that Spock didn't bring this up earlier that Sarek and everything uh, Sarek and Amanda are his parents and so he kind of awkwardly puts Kirk in the position of being like oh these these are your parents um I mean does uh Spock's never really been known for his like you know heart-to-heart chats with uh Kirk he's not just sitting there cracking open a beer and telling right. his life story I guess it doesn't matter he's he's much more uh, the the way I always thought of Vulcans is they're like cold and emotionless people Mm-hmm. Um, I guess not humanoids, not technically the human race, but yeah. they're, they're, they're just, if you took humans and you kind of removed their emotions and just had them act logically, rationally, practically, pick your, pick your adjective that you want to describe it as. Yeah, I think I, I mean, that is sort of what they are. They, they do have that sort of storyline going of them suppressing their emotions and they move beyond it they're supposed to be like sort of a higher level type thing to humans who they see as primitive and everything like that but um i think that the the introduction here of sarek goes pretty well um sarek goes on to be in a really great tng episode called sarek and he's going to be in star trek discovery as a younger man um so he's an important character and the episode is important because it introduces this important character. Um, and I'm assuming that's why we're talking about this episode. That's why we're talking about Journey yeah. to Babel. Yeah, because because of that. Um, well, and next time I sign up for an episode, I need to say, Wes, why are we doing this specific episode? Yes. Well, so that's the reason. So did what did you think, like, as, as an episode of TOS, what did you think of this one? Well, I, if, if I can stick on Sarek for a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. as we were talking before we started recording, and, and one of the things that kind of caught me off guard about him was how like you know catty he was with spock about you know him not following in or or following his wishes and going to the vulcan science academy yeah <laughs> that doesn't seem very vulcan to me that no. just kind of seems uh catty. against the writing of of how you would want their characters to be it'd be like well you know logically you know if you would you were to gain gainful employment and make a difference in the world like you'd think his dad would be okay with that yeah well i so I totally agree, and I think that Sarek holding it against him doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like, that that's a purely emotional response, right? He's upset that Spock has not done what he wants him to do. Yeah. Even if he disagrees with it, I don't think Vulcans should hold grudges, right? They would see that as being not... Not logical. Not logical. What do you gain from growing, holding a grudge? Right, and it's an emotional response, so you shouldn't you shouldn't have some sort of emotionality against something that happened to you. I mean, I, I guess I need to, I wanted to, we started this discussion in a mock time, but I think it's worthwhile breaking down what TOS considers the Vulcans to be, because I think that it's evolving and changing. I don't think that they're, they aren't really obsessed with logic, and we were talking earlier about, like, logic's kind of a hard word to pin on a race. It's not like it's a philosophy as much as a way of achieving their philosophy, the Vulcans to me strike me more as like unemotional rationalists, basically, who use logic to guide their unemotional, rational approach to life and stuff like that. Like, and the amount of times that the episode says that sounds extremely logical, they don't really mean that it's logical. They mean that it's like a rational choice to make, right? Like, you can be 
you can come up with you can have a logical approach and come up with a wrong answer, but the Vulcans aren't interested in that as a philosophy, right? I mean, I think you're right, and maybe part of it is I didn't, uh, you know, break out my Webster's Dictionary right before this to really understand the true meaning of the word logical. And my interpretation of of it was always, you know, um, simple, uh, simple, practical. Um, like uh, I don't, I don't remember the uh, the the theorem. Uh, it has a name. You probably remember it. Uh, that the the simplest answer is most likely the uh, the right one. So I'll give you the internet definition. Logic is reasoning conducted or assessed according to a strict principle of validity. So it's basically debate tactics, right? Like you you can agree that this is the right path to take because it seems more valid than another path. It's like a scientific method type thing. You, get, you gather information that then would guide your next steps. Right. And the Vulcans aren't going to be engaged in like ad hoc attacks and stuff like that because it's a logic fallacy and things like that. So they're very... They will proceed down the path of most valid seeming options. Yeah, I, I really just think it's it's a narrative. It's a narrative device. Yeah, it, it allows it, it them to kind like of a cool word. Yeah, it, it sounds cool right. when when <laughs> when Spock's like, "Well, that's not logical." Right. They can kind of play a little loose and fast with whatever the episode demands logic to be, and then they can kind of justify what may seem to be non-human like reactions to situations uh, that. You know, and and this is obviously a key uh, key plot point later, where you know uh, Spock doesn't want to go through the the operation because he would be giving up uh, captainship of the the Enterprise. They can justify unhuman responses to things, yes, and just kind of say, "Well, this is different than us." You know, let's let's examine how this other alien race would do it. Right. So maybe it'll be a little bit choppy. I feel I feel the episode's a little bit choppy, but does I think my major problem with journey to babel is the fact that i don't think that spock's decision is all that well thought out as to what he's supposed to do as to whether he's not supposed to save his father or he's supposed to stop the enterprise from being attacked and everything like that like it doesn't sarek's role in the story to me isn't important enough to warrant saving him you know it's not like he's an integral part of the negotiations or anything like that he's just the guy who's there to handle the negotiations you know what i mean it's not like well the, the human response is you're not supposed to let your dad die. right you're not supposed to let your dad <laughs> die but he, he, at this so i mean but does spock have any leg to stand or spock seems to be in the right to me where he's like you know what kirk got shanked down the hallway i need to save the enterprise that's the right response isn't it that was kind of my my thought too, and I mean not not to take away from Plan B, which would have been Scotty as captain. Well, you Scotty's know? always captain. And, and <laughs> something that's funny about TOS is the amount of times that Scotty is in command. He's he's that'd be like Jordy being in command. That never happens. No, he's he's the fallback character. Whenever anyone needs to leave the ship, all the important people leave, and Scotty's the person who stays back on the ship. That's like his thing. They just had really bad protocols, uh, you know, 100 years before TNG, I think is what it comes down to. I understand it's because you want to get your stars on screen more. I, mm-hmm. I completely get that. But narratively, it didn't always click. No, and they do it way too often. Yeah. Well, like, every every time there's an away team, you got to have Spock and Bones on it. I just, yeah. Well, they're the... I mean, that's something to talk about, the TOS style. Um this has changed. In early TOS, like, the ship felt more alive, and now it feels like it's those three guys just kind of walking around on the ship, and everyone else is kind of just servicing the story or them or whatever they needed to be done. Well, Shatner's got to chew on some scenery, so you need to allow him to do that. Yeah, and I don't mind it. I think they've got the characters down and stuff, but it, it does feel a little bit... It, it does feel... I think Clay mentioned this, that, like... The TOS story generation process feels a little bit more samey than TNG's does because you have less to move, you have less pieces to move around. And so, I mean, if you were to just see a random clip from an episode, you, there would be a good chance that you would not be able to pick which episode it was from. I mean, even if you were fairly familiar with the series. Yeah, and if you were to pick a random moment in time, one of those three people are going to be in 99% of the clips like if you were to freeze yeah. time randomly in a tos episode and not have one of those three characters in it you'd be like a bullseye basically like did they ever and and i know we're getting off on crazy tangents here but i think it's kind of interesting that tng had a lot of character centric episodes um you know there were geordie episodes there were uh woefully few troy episodes 
Um, but were there ever episodes where they're just like, this is a Chekhov episode, and we're going to really delve... Chekhov's going to be on screen 85% of the time, No, we it's all about him. We haven't seen We haven't seen an Uhura episode. Scotty yeah. hasn't had an episode. There hasn't been a single episode that hasn't been about Kirk, Bones, or Spock at this point. Not that I can remember. The others have had major plot lines involved in it, but they haven't had the story dedicated to them and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, so I think it's just a difference in the nature of the show where clearly those were the, the three main characters. And I think they were they're the only ones who were billed, right? And the opening yeah. credits. Yep. And McCoy's so, new this season. Yeah. So I mean I think that was that was certainly part of it. That it wasn't designed as an ensemble cast. It was really designed as these two to three main characters and a supporting cast. So if we if we go back to Sarek and Spock here, I think you were saying that you thought that the the storyline between them was sort of unsatisfying. And I, I feel like the I feel like the major problem here is that it doesn't really focus enough on their it doesn't stick with like a plot thread. Like we know that Sarek and Spock don't get along, right? That's not really a big plot issue. It's kind of just like the getting off like you meet them and they're like, Oh, I don't really talk to him. Um, and then Spock helps his father and his father's like, well, that was a logical thing to do. So good for you. Um, there's not really a strong, there's not really a strong like backbone to the story. It switches between the negotiation, there's a murderer on board, and then all of a sudden it becomes the medical story about Spock has to save his father at the end. And it's like, it feels like it flips unnecessarily. I mean, isn't that part of the problem? To me, this episode felt very overstuffed. Like, there was a negotiation, then there's the assassin, then there's the medical drama, then there's the alien ship, and it's just like they kept bringing in so many kind of disparate plot lines yeah. and, and pushing them all all together. Yep. And uh, to answer your question from earlier, you know, I, I would have, uh, like Spock, probably not done the procedure. I don't know that I would have wanted uh, Scotty in command, you know, and, yep. and that would have been the, the uh, in line with his character to stick to his duty. And uh, I think one of the other things we said before is that I, I really disliked how the storyline, the, the writing just kind of had Jim f- uh, fake that he was better. Yeah. Because narratively, that seemed to that seemed to get out of the main conflict in the story. It, it just found an interesting workaround rather than having the characters work their way through it. Right. I mean, and Kirk seems unnecessarily interested in Spock saving his father. Right. Like the, the main thrust of Bones and Kirk in this one seems to be like, well, you have to help your dad. You know, even if it's like the wrong decision and Kirk is um, basically captaining with a stab wound on him. And the series has gone out of its way to be like only Kirk can command the Enterprise. Like he's everyone else can kind of, you know, try, but they're going to fail. Basically, at some lines, like only Kirk is capable of doing this. So even if he's critically injured, he's better than anyone else in this position. You know, a 60 percent Kirk is like a 110 percent Scotty, I guess. uh, Yeah, (laughs) basically. Yeah. They ever let Uhura captain the ship? Does that ever come up as a No, she actually it's actually kind of the only weird holdover because when everyone else leaves, even if she's like the ranking person, she's never allowed to command the ship. Because it was a woman and it was the nineteen sixties. Yeah, it was a black woman. It was, it was yes, also a black woman. Uh so that was your this is the sixties moment from Yeah, I don't think in terms that, of political I don't change. Think this, well, I guess this this is the sixties moment here. I, a lot of criticism about this one comes to the fact of Amanda, uh Sarek's wife's treatment. Um I don't People say it's sexist or whatever. I don't I don't think it's all that bad. And it's also I mean, it is like in human terms, it would be it's basically like what he says. There's a lot of like wife come here her like wife stand here. Oh, OK. I was I was wondering where the. Uh, yeah. So you mean the nature of the relationship yeah. that it was very he was he was very dominant. Yes, he's very dominant yeah. to her. And I, I mean, in a human type thing. But I mean, it's they're also not a human relationship. Right. So it's like. I don't I don't feel the need to apply the sexist standard to the Vulcans. She seems to be she seems to have it's not like she's a meek person either. You know what I mean? They're like what would you think of Amanda in this episode? I thought she she had some good emotional uh lines like, you know, obviously we're we we're talking before again and when she slaps Spock that's meant to emotionally resonate, yeah. you know, like as if we're watching City on the Edge of Forever. Uh, but it didn't really click for me. Yeah, you know, it just it just kind of seemed very forced. I was I was reading about the actress, and she's saying that she gets like more fan mail for that than she does for any for other acting roles that sure. she ever had for that like one episode. But 
you yeah, know, I think she comes back in the movies or something. She does. She yeah. comes back, I think, in four or six. Oh, sure, she okay. makes a reappearance. Yeah. One of the good ones by your math. Mm. Um, but uh, I think my greater issue with it is y- you're right. You can sort of get around the he's acting sexist if you say that they're an alien culture and they have different ways of acting. You can't really get around the why is she interested in this douchebag right. thing because she's supposed to be a rational and initially through the first half of the episode she's kind of portrayed as a a strong-willed equal of Sarek like she kind of stands up to him a couple times and kind of checks him yeah. and then she just kind of gets reduced to an emotional bumbling fool at various points later on. Yeah, I think that the if someone had written this in a review uh, that I was reading it's like you the episode kind of implies that human and Vulcan pairings are unusual, right? Because it would be like no no human could deal with these sort of unemotional aspects of the, the Vulcans where they're never going to tell you that they love you or anything like that. So their point was kind of like it seems like it should be a unusual human who would get into that kind of relationship. And she doesn't seem that unusual. She seems to have somewhat adopted the Vulcan mindset where she's not super emotional about things she eventually gets there to like drive spock into it and everything but she is sort of deferential to the vulcan way of life and i think my problem with her is that she always kind of comes off as like a stepmother to spock and doesn't really seem to me ever like she's his biological mother like when they're introduced right wouldn't the natural thing to have been to have her reveal the fact that they are parents to him she doesn't say anything when she sees him yeah i don't know if she was just deferring to sarah there but you never and i think this is another point you're hinting at you never really get the feeling that she like really loves spock right the way that's a human mother would that's what i'm that's what i'm seeing she doesn't yeah. bring a humanness to it that and she, that leaves it me seems thinking, like she likes sarah more than she likes, likes spock. spock yeah and that doesn't seem right to me and i would have appreciated more of a human she does like the you know, she has her ending line. She was like, I've had enough of this logic stuff. And it's like, I, I should have seen more of that early on. You know, she should be kind of encouraging, and she does in the episode, but she should be encouraging more his humanity, right? Because that's what she would yeah. relate to in him. I would have liked her if she were written more like a, and, and I don't like Luoxana Troy, but if she if she had a little bit more sass and flair on the level of a Luoxana Troy. Yeah. Like, kind of was really, like, you know, witty and and definitely was portrayed outgoing, to be I outgoing yeah. and portrayed to be his equal. That would have been a good contrast to kind of the the logical Vulcanness of, yes. of Sarek. <laughs> and Sarek would have been okay with it because he's indifferent to it. You know what I mean? Like... Yeah. They don't. They don't get emotionally involved in like the outburst. And so. and if you are a creature that lives hundreds of years, is it logical to marry a human that's going to die like well, he in likes, thirty years? He, he likes to have a little turnover in his. Uh, well, his uh, you, you were saying like, that he has a second human wife yes, in and, uh, in TNG. So, yep. you know, I don't know if that's logical. He, <laughs> you know, his his emotions might have been driving a different part of him as in in that uh, way. But yeah, I, and I I think that the other sort of comment um, is that the episode's a little bit. It's funny in how similar it is to TNG's Sarek. Like, Sarek always gets sick whenever he appears. Like, that's just his... He comes in and he gets sick, and that's every single episode that he's ever been featured I mean, he in. could just be faking it, trying to, like, get back at uh, people who are close to him, like Spock. I don't know, but... I wouldn't have had him get sick in this episode. I don't really like the uh, him getting sick aspect of it. Him having heart attack, basically. Um, I would have gone some other way to reveal the Spock and Sarek relationship a little bit better because Sarek doesn't really have any choice in any of this right like he, he's not making a decision to be like you know what Spock you're a pretty good guy as well and I'm sorry that I'm being so emotional about it he's unconscious for a good portion of what's going on right yeah so it's like you're, you're putting all the you're putting all the like decision on Spock and Spock has this sort of uninteresting choice about whether he saves his father or he saves the, the ship and it just doesn't feel like it really the script doesn't really know what the point of what it's trying to say is i guess would be my my ultimate feeling about it yeah i'm i wasn't and again i i felt this uh, episode was just very overstuffed i almost think it might have worked better had they just pulled out that entire plot line and just focused on the on the the diplomatic 
um dinner part not the dinner party itself but, but the, the, kind of yeah, the kind of them going to it's called journey to to babel they never really get there babel god damn babel it. sorry <laughs> they, they never they never get to babel uh the whole point is about these these different uh uh alien uh groups having having different interests and there's obviously some conflict there and it kind of goes unexplored and instead they just choose to kind of change course about 20 minutes into the episode after uh numerous uh, very interesting assassination attempts um some successful some not uh to focus more on this uh uh spock issue yeah so i just feel like neither plot line neither of those two plot lines got fully fleshed out yeah and i think it's a weaker episode because of it babel is apparently the biblical name for babylon so See, that's that's what I thought. So you know, wouldn't you? What is? But what does that have? In, why is the planet called Babel? Like, what what about this episode? Am, am I missing a biblical reference about why why Babylon would matter? I, in I this? have no idea. I would have. I have no maybe, idea. Maybe there's some deep meaning of of significance about unification around or father and son. Yeah, maybe drama. I I have no idea. Yeah, someone let me know. I I. And I never saw it in any of the reviews that I was looking at before talking about it. But I, I don't know why it would be called that. The, the, it's another example of the title sounds more impressive than what actually goes on in the episode. Um, I think there was just, just someone who was, uh, you know, some high and mighty writer who was like, I'm going to put lots of biblical references in here. We're going to put lots of weird allusions and then people will think it's highly significant in a few years. I think I agree with you that it's mostly just kind of an overstuffed, underbaked um breakdown of the relationship and i like the Sarek character he's one of my favorite like returning guest stars because i think he does a good job with the vulcan angle um and it's good that spock has another vulcan appear who i can sort of relate to on a vulcany level or at least what i'd expect them to act like as opposed to the vulcans in a mock time so i think that the i think that the sort of crux of it is is it was it worthwhile having these people come into this story? Like, if you were watching this, would you think that Sarek would be a character that's worth exploring further down the line? Well, you knew that he would probably be of somewhat significance simply because he was related to Spock. Yeah. It wasn't like, you know... Haven't seen that before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he just kind of... Uh, He's like, well, it's Spock's family, so let's let's uh, take, a, take a moment to kind of dive into them and sort of what they what their whole deal is. I don't know if we other... do verify that his mother is human. Like that's kind of important, I suppose, because he said that before. So it's nice to see the evidence. Yeah. O- otherwise, you know, I sort of agree that I like, I like his character. I like the coldness. He's sort of like a, he comes off as like a Spock on steroids. Yeah. Like he comes off as more of a douche than Spock at his douchiest moments. Is... To me. I don't know. Anyway, maybe yes. that's just me, but I think, I think like it would be, they do come off a little bit douchey, but it's mostly because they don't really get served in any way where they show why their thing is. I guess the closest it comes to is when Sarek argues with the Tellarite, right? And the Tellarite's like, tell me what you're going to be doing about this. And he's like, he basically shuts down the argument in a kind of an effective way of just saying like, you argue, you're arguing about nothing. And then he defends himself. They don't have a lot of scenes like that where the Vulcans are not portrayed particularly arrogantly but they just have a better way of handling situations or like showing that their way leads to better outcomes in a lot of situations spock does it just because he solves the problem all the time he's kind of like data light but i could have done with more of that and i could have done with spock you know what's kind of missing from this one spock and sarek never have a scene where they try to out argue each other wouldn't that seem they, to be they the out logic each other? Yeah, wouldn't that seem to be the way that Vulcans would like sort of fight with each other? They would try to out argue each other, and they never do that. I don't know. I mean, I, if they're both acting logically, then what would they have to argue about? Well, th- I guess that goes back to the definition. They could have different points of view that are equally logical, right? Yes. So that that's like the that's the so problem. Mine's the most logical point of view. No, mine is <laughs> this is superior. <laughs> so that's kind of the the problem with. I think that's the essence. The show conflates logic with correctness. Yeah. Kind of. And I just always feel like the Vulcans just kind of come off as like their 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 ass don't stink. Like they're they're above it all. Like we're acting logically. We're not prone to your your wimpy human emotions. Yeah. And that's 
kind of feels like a, a through line with Spock. And then Sarah comes in and he's just like, well, at least you see flares of uh, of of a good person within Spock. Like right off the bat, yeah. you know, Sarek is kind of generally douchey to everyone. He does sort of talk down that that Telluride, uh, but otherwise, you know, he he doesn't really seem to have a lot of redeeming qualities that that endear you to him. Yeah, I don't think you get a good chance to know him really in this, yeah. right? Like you don't you don't he's he's. I just thought it was interesting. He wasn't really particularly praised as like a great ambassador or anything like he later would be. Um, they don't really hype him up in any kind of way. He's just kind of the ambassador. He's here to talk about this negotiation. I mean, my, my viewpoint always defaults to uh, whatever McCoy is thinking. And McCoy's like, what the hell is with these stupid rituals? <laughs> and I'm just like, yep, right there with you. Right there with you, buddy. Yeah. Um I don't know. I guess we'll wrap it up. We'll play an audio clip. Me and Mark are going to come back, and we're going to give our final thoughts and feelings about Journey to Babel. That big-headed Balkan Stan. I couldn't have pulled him through without it. Some doctors have all the luck. Captain, I believe you'll find the alien. We damage the ship. They destroy themselves to avoid capture. Bones, Thelov's body will be brought to your lab. I want an autopsy performed as soon as possible. I think you'll find he's an Orion, Doctor. Orion? Intelligence reports that Orion smugglers have been raiding the Corridan system. But what would they gain by an attack on Starfleet? Mutual suspicion and interplanetary war. Yes, of course, with Orion carefully neutral. They'd clean up by supplying dilithium to both sides and continue to raid Corridan. The thing that confused me was the power utilization curve. It made them seem more powerful than a starship or anything known to us. That ship was constructed for a suicide mission. Since they never intended to return to their home base, they could use 100% power on their attacks. The thing I don't understand is why I didn't think of it earlier. All right, Mark, so I walked away from this one thinking that maybe neither of us were particularly impressed with the episode. What do you think? So it was, uh, I just thought it was very uneven and they just stuffed too many plot lines into it. Was it watchable somewhat? You know, I'd probably default it at a three. Um, you know, there were just some scenes that were entertaining. Uh, we discussed the, uh, the the smash cut to Kirk in the middle yeah, fighting in the, fight. in the hallway. He's just all of a sudden fighting in the hallway. It has um, a very gif- that fight is very gifable. Was his uh, it's like his wall run, yeah, elbow drop move. He, 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 he got some episode. parkour. I think he tried to like drop his butt on the guy's head. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what why that would be a good move. I never attack someone butt first. I need to but. know. I need to know how the fight scenes were filmed. His fighting stuff is so bizarre. Like I know that I don't know if he had like a director who was telling him what to do, or if this is pure Shatner just being like, "I'm just gonna jump off the wall and jump onto this guy." I think they just like uh, watched like West Side Story, like the knife fights yeah. from that, and they're like, "Let's do that." Yeah, and. I, I think that I think I kind of agree with that. I'm pretty sure this is a three to me. Um it's more probably more important for Sarek than it is for being a good episode or anything like that. Um I don't find it particularly I don't find it particularly outstanding. I don't feel anything is really all that wrong with it. It's it strikes me as very middling and not particularly something that feels as fleshed out or focused as a higher ranking episode would be. Yeah, it's just definitely one of those episodes that, you know, I just kind of like to just sort of laugh at some of the quirks of the 60s, you know, like a few of the things we've mentioned um, and just not pay too much attention to the plot line because it does kind of fall apart a little bit, even though uh, I think the characters and some of the stuff they introduced will have significance later on. Yeah, obviously. And uh, we also just have one antenna is is what I've learned. Yes. The Andorian just goes around with having a fake Andorian goes around with yes, having he's, one, he's an one antenna that apparently they, they hit the tracker in one antenna, which just fell off at the exact right time. <laughs> it was the uh, it was the the flimsy one, I suppose. Yeah, they just they resolve it by saying the Orions are basically space pirates who were setting everything up. And that's it. Uh, I, I guess I will wrap it up by just saying that the ending is kind of fun. I think the ending scene might be my favorite part of it, although it plays like it was a comedy episode when it was not a comedy episode uh, where so- uh, Sarek and Spock, they have the line about like, why did you marry her? And he says, well, it seemed like it was a logical decision at the time. And then everyone goes, ha ha ha. And then Bones yells at everybody and says, ah, I finally had the last word in the credits roll, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. And, and I think that's, Part of the part of the problem with the old T, uh, TOS episodes is that uh, tonally they they are all over the place. <laughs> 
like they jump they jump between comedy to being like this is high stakes yeah um and that was just another another example of that another moment in time well mark thanks for coming on to talk about babel or babel as it's called <laughs> I'm glad we ended on that. That was certainly very important. Yeah. Well, guys, thanks very much. If you enjoyed the content today and you're on YouTube, or a like and a comment is appreciated. If you're on iTunes, you can rate us there. Rate us on any of the podcasters, Stitcher, Pocket Cast. I don't think that one can rate, but any of those. Facebook.com slash the Penske Podcast. You can go to Patreon.com slash the Penske Podcast. And for a couple dollars a month, you get extra content. Me and Clay just did Suicide Squad and Ex Machina for the month of March. So new stuff is coming out in April. You can head over to Patreon and check that out. Uh, and that's about it. Yeah, Mark, I'm going to give this one a three. Did you say you're giving it a three as well? Yeah, I think I defaulted yeah, it's a three. three. Journey to Babel. Important for Sarek and Spock and all that stuff. I like the fact that they refined the Vulcans, but I think it's just kind of an average episode. Nothing really blew me away yeah. about it. And we never saw Babel. Never saw Babel. We never saw what an Orion looks like. We never really confirmed if he was an Orion. They just kind of conjecture that at the end of the episode, that that's what happened. Well, unfortunately, he miscalculated with the slow yes. poison, <laughs> so we never we never could really find out the the full story there. His slow acting poison, slow acting, tough, slow acting, ten acting as uh, yeah, slow acting poison and the self destructing ship that uh, Spock would have realized had uh, you know not been distracted by his dying father. Had uh, Mrs. Gene Roddenberry uh, or no, no, that's Lu- yeah, Lu- Lu- Luoxana yeah. Troy nurse uh, didn't uh, knock him out too early, right? Yeah. No sexual tension between Chapel and Spock either, which is unusual because that usually is sprinkled in. That's it, guys. Thank you very much for listening, and we will be back with what the hell episode? Babel. It's either uh, it's Mirror to Mirror or something like that. Mirror Mirror or Doomsday Machine, I think. Sorry, I can't know off the top of my head. But anyway, I'll see you then.